everyone. Welcome inside the FamilyDeal.com 7 Sports Cave. I'm your host, Justin Rose. Big show tonight, 200th hosting episode for myself. How about that? MLive Lions beat reporter Kyle Meinke. He makes his ninth appearance on the show in that time. We'll discuss what's good with the Lions thus far in training camp and what's maybe not so good. We'll go one-on-one -on -one with Taylor Decker, who handed out some marriage advice. And later, Justin Oren Duff from the USPBL is here to talk about their first player to make it all the way from Jimmy John's Field in Utica to the major leagues. But first, let's get through some of the news of the day. For the second day in a row, Matthew Stafford kept off the practice field. He was seen running the new hill at the practice facility in Allen Park, but the team is hoping to limit the wear and tear on his body as the season continues to get closer. Now, it's nothing to worry about, according to head coach Matt Patricia, because he said it was something that they had predetermined they were going to do back in July. We thought it'd be a good opportunity coming out of New England before we head to Houston, which would be another really kind of intense couple days of practice that um, be just a good opportunity for him to, uh, you know, be at practice. He's going to do what whatever is scripted for him to do for the, the day and then um, give some of the other guys an opportunity to go out and compete and then also just, um, you know, allow him. He's, he's been doing this, uh, you know, he's professional. He handles himself really well, prepares really hard. He's great in the meeting. So just thought it was a good break in the action in the middle part of training camp to do that. Now the offensive line will certainly have a big say in how well the offense can move the ball, especially now that it's a run first type of offense. Now, of course, we didn't see that in the first preseason game last Thursday, but it was primarily the backups getting all the reps. I caught up with starter Taylor Decker after practice today, who feels that this unit will be able to move some people around. Nobody probably loves the way that you guys performed on Thursday, but it is preseason, and how easy or difficult is it to remind yourself of that when you're coming back out here and getting back to work? Uh, I mean, I think the big thing right now is just learning from things every single day so um, obviously not the outcome you'd want but a lot of learning to be done on that tape so we came in um, learned from it and, and moved on to come out here and compete every single day they've invested a lot in this group up front when you look at each side of you and, and different guys on the line how much you guys can make this team and this offense go yeah i mean i think we got a great group a great blend of personalities um you know a bunch of guys that can go in there and they can compete and uh you know everybody's expected to come out there and play at a high level all right now the important question i'm getting married in three weeks from okay. yesterday Congratulations. so you just went through it yeah. so so give me give me give me you know some advice I'm, I'm nervous here man i just bought my wife a horse so buy her a horse <laughs> There you go. She'll be really happy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so after the wedding, the horse comes. But I, you know, waking up week of, you know, give me, give me, some, call me down here. Um, I mean, I, I just know the the big thing for me is, you know, she. I'm not. I'm gonna get sappy and cliche, but she, she makes me a better man, and, I, and I'm better for being with her. Um, I'll kick my coverage, as I'm sure a lot of guys feel that way. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you feel that Absolutely. way. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Just keep that in mind, I guess. Ah, thank you very much for that, Taylor. I appreciate all that good insight as we move forward here. All right, speaking of moving forward, former Tiger Nicholas Castellanos now with the Cubs. He complained about the dimensions of Comerica Park before he was traded, how it was too deep and that other ballparks are more forgiving to home run hitters. Well, over the last two days, the Kansas City Royals proved that theory is wrong. Royals got to Daniel Norris early, two batters after giving up a leadoff homer to Whit Merrifield. Hunter Dozier adds a solo shot, making it two to nothing in the first. Tigers answer in the bottom of the inning. Nico Goodrum might be a better hitter than Nick Castellanos, at least on this swing. 11th home run of the year, cuts Kansas City's lead in half. But more trouble for Norris through the third. Jorge Soler, a two run shot. He and Dozier would both homer twice in this game alone. The Royals would hit 11 home runs over the four game series. And today they cruise to a 10 2 win. Been dealing with a little blister on the finger and it's trying to change my change up grip to just be conducive to throwing that. And it just couldn't really find it today. So I they eliminated that and then just left some fastballs middle and um, couldn't get them off that just because I wasn't throwing anything else for strikes. So that's kind of what happens when you can't throw your off speed for strikes. Yeah, the season can't end soon enough. Brad Keselowski has already secured a spot in the NASCAR playoffs, but he's still chasing that elusive first Michigan International Speedway win. He had a pretty good opportunity today. He was on the pole for the Consumers Energy 400 out at MIS. He led a race-high 66 laps, but 
During stage two, he gets loose due to a flat rear right tire. Nice job avoiding hitting the wall. He'd have to pit. Ultimately, he would end the day 19th. Keselowski's teammate from Team Penske, Joey Logano, he led with 17 laps to go, but Kevin Harvick slips past Logano and takes that checkered flag. It's his second win of the season, and just like a year ago, he wins the August race at MIS. How about some golf? Patrick Reed, the solo leader, entering the final round of the Northern Trust. Third shot from the bunker on the par 5 eighth. He's human. Can't get out of the bunker. Reed had three bogeys in the first six holes to start his round, but he was much better on the back nine. He makes the birdie putt on 14. He's now 15 under. Abraham Answer, he was sitting at 14 under on the 17th green, a chance for birdie. He gets that to go, moves to 15 under, trails Reed by a stroke. Answer makes another putt on 18 as well, forcing Reed to make his to win the tournament, avoiding that playoff. But that shorty, he gots that. Reed wins the Northern Trust. It's his first win since the 2018 Masters. He moves up from 50th to second in the FedEx Cup standings. All right, plenty more coming up here on the 200th hosted episode of the 7 Sports Cave. Kyle Meinke, he's going to be talking with me from Lions Camp about that team. Maybe they'll make a bigger step forward in week two of the preseason. That's coming up next on the FamilyDeal.com 7 Sports Cave. Stay with us. Welcome back to the FamilyDeal.com 7 Sports Cave. That panic button. I think you all know what I'm talking about. It's a common item if you're a Detroit Lions fan because every year you seem to pull it out. This year's team always on thin ice, especially for fans who hope for the best, but they've been disappointed before. I caught up with M Live Lions beat reporter, reporter Kyle Meinke after practice today to discuss the current state of the Lions after that dreadful first preseason game. How do we break down a preseason? Because it is only the preseason. I just think the one thing that sticks off to me is the disparity on the box score. I mean, didn't even get 100 total yards, gave up 459 total yards to not Tom Brady. It's the Patriots, but it's not the starting Patriots, and yep. it's not the starting Lions either. So how do you, when you look at the film yourself and how these guys, coaches, and players look at that, how do you take, what do you take away? I, first of all, I take nothing away from it in terms of how good this team will be. Nothing. I mean, you know, no, no Matthew Stafford, Marvin Jones, on Johnson, on and on down the line. I, defensively, no Trey Flowers, Sex Harrison, True. Quan, Trey Diggs. I mean, any guy of any import for this team did not play in that game. So you can't really draw anything from it in terms of how good the Lions are. What you're really looking for when they're not running schemes or anything like that, no game plans out there, you're looking at one-on-one -on -one matchups. Can a guy win his one-on-one -on -one matchup? And I think that's where the disappointing uh, thing is for the Lions. You saw a lot of, in particular, I think, offensive linemen mm -hmm. and defensive linemen not winning one-on-one -on -one matchups. Um, and that's a big takeaway for me. I think maybe there's less depth, um, particularly on the offensive line, where they're not really have any, they don't really have any injuries. And sure. it's just guys getting beat for nine sacks. A little bit on David Fales, I think, for hanging out of the ball uh, too long in that game yeah. a few times. But the offensive line was beat. That's something that you have to look at going forward. So taking that away, I mean, they'll go look at the tape. They'll throw out the parts that they don't really care about. They'll really hone in on the things that they do. What what steps? I mean, will we see a drastic improvement from week preseason one to week preseason two, or is it still so early on in the installation of offensive and defensive schemes yeah. that it's still just one-on-one -on -one matches? Well, they set, they set the bar pretty low, so I think, <laughs> I think, you're I right. think we'll see something better uh, week two. But again, they're not going to go out there and run anything that they're going to run in the, in the regular season. And then you might see a series or two from Matthew Stafford and some of the starters. I think we'll, I think we'll see that as they try to get uh, a feel for game speed in the new offense, but nothing that's going to put them in injury's way. And they're not going to anything schematically that's interesting going into the season. Right. Matt Patricia is He's careful what he talks about in press conferences because he thinks what beat writers write could end up in an opposing coaching room, scouting sure. report, whatever. So he's not going to go out there on national TV and run a play that, that somebody else can, can crib notes from. Right. Um, so it's, again, it's very vanilla schematically. You've heard it before, right? Preseason doesn't matter. That's why it doesn't matter. What you're looking for is one on one matchups and can guys win those matchups. That's something we didn't see across the board in week one uh, and so, certainly something they'll be looking for in week two. Trey Flowers back on the practice field. How do you look over the last couple days? Well, he's 
it's not doing too much right now. We just talked to Darius Slay, I mean, just a few seconds ago, and Slay was talking about, you know, how, how, how being in shape and then being in practice shape are two different things. And of course, being in game shape is a, a totally different thing as well. But he's running on the side, he's doing his conditioning, Slay was, and he comes out here his first week of practice, and like he said, he could barely make it through all of practice. And that's a super athletic guy, super mm -hmm. fast guy. So it, it gives you an idea, an illustration of, of how long that process can be for a guy working back into practice shape. Trey Flowers has not practiced since last season. He's been out the entire year recovering from shoulder surgery. So he's just he's been eased, eased into it, Justin. He hasn't really right. done too much, um, hasn't been asked to do too much. We saw a little bit of one-on-ones today, just not enough you can really glean anything from. Nothing team-wise. Uh, I'll be more interested to see what he does next week in Houston, if he's active for one-on-ones. All right, rapid fire round. I want to know what the most optimistic part of this team is right now? Defensive line. D d defense in general, I mean, they're top 10 in the second half of last year, and then you load up with Trey Flowers, right? You have Snacks Harrison with a full off season uh, around here. I, I think the defense, the defense in general it should be top 10. I think that defensive line could be top five. Wow. It should be. I really do because you have so many guys at so many positions, and they can go up and down the line. I mean, Trey Flowers, right, he's a great defensive end, but he can line up anywhere across that sure. defensive line. Same thing with Deshaun Hand. You can roll out three and four guys out there, and, and an offense cannot know where those guys are going to line up. And it's so deep uh, in terms of the personnel. Um, I, I just think that has a chance to be a real strength for this team. Give me the other side. What are you least optimistic about? Well, the offense has been up and down, putting it mildly, and, and in particular, Matthew Stafford. I, I'm. Concern is putting it too strongly, Justin, but he's certainly somebody I'm keeping an eye on. He has been more up and down than I remember seeing in previous years, particularly downfield. You know, he's, he's normally pretty consistent as a veteran guy in camp, and he's just he's missed some simple stuff downfield. He's missed simple out routes to Danny Amendola. Dan, Danny Amendola looks great. In yeah, he super does. Fast. He's creating separation. And I'm telling you, Stafford's just not quite like locked in with that guy. Um, there's something a little bit off. And it, it's, it's not that Stafford's been bad. I, I'm not saying that. Right. But it's, he's been inconsistent, more inconsistent than I've seen in previous years. He's 31 now. He played through the bad back last year. They have a new scheme this year. There, there's a lot of things going on in this guy's uh, transformation from, from, from last year to this year. And I'm just a little, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on him because he's been just inconsistent and then getting a, almost a full week's worth of, re uh, of rest this week between player off days and taking two days off in practice itself, something we haven't really seen from him before. I, I, the Lions are downplaying it, Justin, but I do think that, that there's something that they're a little concerned about and they're trying to be proactive with his health. Really? That's a very interesting thought. I mean, if we look at training camp like the coaches look at training camp, what's the biggest thing you want to see in week two preseason game after they go down to Houston and have a couple of joint practices? What do you what do you want to see jump off the tape for you? It's a great question. I just need to see better one-on-one -on -one performances from the offensive line. I mean, most of those guys aren't going to be playing much. Um, I thought Joe, Joe Dow, I, th I thought it was actually a bright spot for the offensive line and he might be the leader at this point for the left guard spot. But you, you saw a lot of snaps from guys who were competing for his last couple of jobs up front, and nobody really stood out. There were some real issues up there. And then you end up with Tom Savage getting a concussion. Um, David Fales was sacked six times in that game. And, you know, out here at practice the past couple of days with, with Stafford off, David Fales has been the number one quarterback. And we have seen uh, a ton of plays where, in a real life situation, uh, David Fales is not throwing a pass because his, you know, his head's, head's, head's going to be in the turf, right? Uh, so we need to see better, I think, efforts from those guys up front. That, that was a, a huge shortcoming. You're going you're gonna to get guys hurt if you continue to see that kind of those kind of protection issues. It's easy for fans out there to see the preseason game number one here, kind of Matthew Stafford's maybe yeah. off a little bit to go backwards. Are, are you still where you kind of thought they would be? And you don't have to say, but or are you seeing things that are like when they do play real games, when they do matter, they'll be what I thought are better. It, this is my seventh training camp with the Lions, and I, I guess maybe I've just seen so many good preseasons that were followed by terrible regular seasons, and vice versa. I just don't put a ton of stock in what we see, particularly in preseason games. But going off more of what, I, what I've seen in practices, I, I again, I love the defense. I'm I'm super intrigued to see what those guys can do. Um, there's a lot of talent up there, and and we saw what. Patricia can do in terms of schematically engineering some pressure with different blitz packages and all that kind of stuff. Now he's got more toys to play with. Jelani Tavai, who yep. we talked about, the big, the big uh, rookie linebacker. I mean, that, that's going to open up a lot of things defensively in the playbook. Um, but the offense is a little worrying for me, and so I, I, I do think. Listen, I thought this was going to be a team that could win ten games or lose ten games based on the coaching, and I guess that's where I still stand. Okay. If Matt Patricia. Uh, learns from his year one rookie mistakes and, and gets better as a coach and, and corrects some of those things that were bothering players and did not function well in terms of the, of the organization. I think this team has a chance to really pull it together with a, a good defense and a balanced offense. But if we see him lapse into some 
uh, of his like his worst uh, impulses, you know, um, I think it could be difficult once again. Uh, the, the culture clashes last year in the locker room were a real thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of players talking about it, and, and that was an issue. And um, I think Patricia's done a nice job this year, Justin, of of really. Uh, you know, we've seen some differences out here. You've been out here. It's, yeah. it's been much quieter, we'll say, sure. from the head coach. He's been much more, much more composed. Um, so I do think there's some, some reasons for optimism there. Some players I talk to do say they've seen differences from him in the meeting rooms and how things are being run. Um, so we'll see. I think, I think it's optimistic at this point, actually, regardless of the 31-3 to loss. Look at that. Kyle Meinke. You can read his stuff at MLive.com. All season, all training camp, all year. This guy never puts the pencil down. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah. your time. Yep, there he is. Make sure you read his stuff, mlive.com. All right, coming up, you got to hear the story from Uber driver to make it league minimum in professional baseball. Yeah. USPBL is the one that made that happen. We'll talk to one of the guys who helped make that happen coming up next here on thefamilydeal.com. Seven Sports Kids, stay with us. Welcome back to thefamilydeal.com, 7 Sports Cave. Joined now by Justin Orenduff, the do-it-all baseball operations general manager, talent finder, talent evaluator, talent fixer over at the USPBL in Utica. Look, we've got the big story from the USPBL. Not only was there a walk-off winner this afternoon over at Jimmy John's Field, but we got a guy playing in uh, Major League Baseball that got his start with you guys. How cool is that? Oh, it's unbelievable, and it's honestly the pinnacle of what we strive to do at the USPBL of take these undrafted, overlooked, smaller Division I players, bring them into the league, develop them, hopefully get them signed first, and then for them to reach the major leagues, you know, that's the biggest accomplishment we can have. Randy Dobnex pitched what? Four scoreless innings? Four scoreless innings. Six hits for the Minnesota Twins. I mean, this guy was driving an Uber in 2016. Now he's making league minimum. <laughs> Playing with the Twins. Now, take me through, like, you, I know you and I have talked a lot about, like, player development and how cool USPBL is for just another option for players who still want to yeah. play professional ball. The money's not necessarily great over there, but it's still keeping that dream that we all kind of have sitting at home going, man, I wish I could play professional sports. Looking at Randy's case, are you surprised that he's playing in the major league now? This quickly, yes. But I'm not surprised at how consistently he continues to perform. I mean, he was in our league for seven weeks. He came into our league, had the ability to really pitch. We kind of helped him have a little bit more stuff, increase the feel a little bit, a little sharper break and stuff. Twins notice, sign him in 17. At every level that he's pitched, he's continued just to brand himself as this consistent performer. What about that consistent Fu Manchu that he's rocking? That, that, well, that facial hair is something else. That, that's new. You know, and that's something that has really carved out a little niche of a fan following and allowed him to really go. Did you speak with him? Did he reach out to you guys? How, how has that relationship continued as he's made his way through? I sent him a message on the night that he found out and we found out. And honestly, like his dad continues and his family are huge supporters of the USPBL. So, you know, I always follow really his success through his dad's eyes on Facebook. When you look at the, the impact, I mean, what's that clubhouse like now with all these other guys? You have four teams over there. They're all seeing Randy go out and pitch basically a gem out there. They're probably like, what do I got to do to get that opportunity? Is that kind of the buzz over there? It changes the entire scope of, you know, as a staff what we do, how we can kind of communicate, market to future players of the USPBL. And for this season, you know, this week we also had two players, our 33rd and 34th players sign uh, with the Rockies. So we're, we're having a lot of success on the field and these players that are currently in the USPBL, you know, there's a good energy going around to say, whoa, this is actually a gateway to where I can actually get to the major leagues. I know you're well connected with major league uh, personnel, if you will. These signings can only keep more guys calling you guys, knocking on the door, sending scouts. Have you guys seen an uptick in attendance by scouts and people asking for tape of different guys or, or because of not just Randy, but over the past couple of years, 34 players now signed by major league teams. Absolutely. And so, you know, one thing that I do weekly is create this email list of all the statistics and analytics on our guys, include some video, and we've had more organizations jump on board that list. And so we don't necessarily have to have scouts at the game because we can kind of send them the info now so they can get a pulse of who's in the league. And every player that gets signed that has success, the next guy and they're going to be more you know leaning to come to our league we're not done this isn't the last guy we'll see pitching in or playing in the majors for uspbl right i don't think so i think there will be quite a few more 
in the next few years. Now that's a hot take, but coming up next, Justin, thank you so much for being thank here. You, Always appreciate it. You got to hear a hot take from a 12 year old, the youngest hot take we've ever had here on the familydeal.com seven sports game. That's coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back to the familydeal.com seven sports cave. One of the things I like to do around here is, is try to give back to the community if I will. This is Chase. Say hi, Chase. Hi. Chase's mother bought a experience to come into the Channel 7 station, come up to the sports cave at the Chad Tuff Gala a couple of months ago. Something I, I love near and dear. Chad Tuff's really cool. He's a Michigan fan, obviously, but one of the cool things is Chase is going to give us his hot take. I didn't tell him what to say. So whatever comes out of here, this is all Chase. So are you ready? Yeah. All right, my man, the floor is yours. Give us your hot take about the football season coming up. Okay, so my hot take is about the Big Ten football preview. So in the Big Ten East, I think the final game of Michigan and Ohio State will determine the Big Ten East. I believe Michigan will come out on top, and Michigan will go, go to Indy and go to the Big Ten championship game. Michigan State will be 9-3, and three, and also Penn State will be 9-3. and three. Look at this guy. He's coming for my coming for my job. I don't know. I was pretty good. All right, let me ask you this. Who will win the Michigan Michigan State game? Is Michigan going to go undefeated or are they going to maybe uh, um Michigan will win against Michigan State, but they will fall short to Penn State at Penn State. Well, there you go. Now that's the, that's a hot take I can get on board with. Chase, thank you so much for being here, my man. I appreciate. How old are you? And where are you from? 12 and I'm from Farmington Hills, Michigan. Give a shout out to all your classmates out there. Say what up. Shout out to Farmington Steam Academy in Farmington Hills, Michigan. This is great. This is the first, the youngest hot take I think I've ever had on this show before. Chase, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it, and we'll see you soon. Good luck, man, all right? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great stuff there by Chase. How about that? All right, hey, take a look at this video we got today from our Drone 7 Joe Lewis Arena. The demolition continues. Today we got these Great videos from over the Detroit River. They're continuing to take down that historic site. It's still sad to see. A little eerie inside as well. Kind of creepy as well. But look at these videos. Ha! Ah, so many good memories of Joe Lewis Arena. All right. This is the 273rd, I think, episode of the 7 Sports Cave. This is the 200th time I've been in front of it hosting the show. What a dream come true for a kid from St. Clair, Michigan to be able to be in his hometown market, giving you guys weekly sports updates, interviews, and a lot of fun. Hope you guys enjoyed as much as I do. Cheers to another 200 episodes. I'm off next week, but I'll see you in two weeks. Have a great weekend.